welcome to Parliament Through Time podcast. I hope you are all well and safe. This podcast is about the origins, development and current practices of the institution of Parliament in Europe and the Middle East. Each week we will deliver an overview of certain key topics to enhance our understanding of parliamentary life, what lessons we have learned from the past events and how these lessons learned can be applied to today's practices. Last week, we dealt with the rise of parliamentary powers and crisis of expectations from parliaments in Europe in the 19th and 20th century. This week, we are turning our attention to the Arab world by analyzing the beginning of parliamentary development in the Middle East and North Africa region. This episode covers the period from decolonization until the Arab Spring in 2011. We will dedicate a separate episode to cover the events leading to the Arab Spring and its consequences for the region. The podcast series is produced by the Westminster Foundation for Democracy in the framework of the European Union Supported Jordanian House of Representatives Programme. Marko Vyacic, the committee's and oversight expert in the programme, prepared the content of the podcast. I am Lama Sawi, your host for this podcast from the heart of a man, Jordan. As we already discussed in the first episode, Forms of parliamentary life and decision-making existed before the countries of the Middle East and North Africa became independent countries in the 20th century. Today, we will discuss in more detail the first decades of parliamentary development in the countries of the Middle East and North Africa, covering the period from independence until the Arab Spring. Let us go first to the most populous Arab nation, Egypt. After the end of World War I, the 1919 Egyptian Revolution broke out calling for liberty, independence and democracy. The 1923 Constitution of Egypt was in force until 1952. It created a constitutional monarchy with a parliamentary representative system based on separation and cooperation of powers, legislative, executive and judicial. The parliament under the 1923 Constitution was bicameral made up of the House of Representatives and the Senate. From 1923 until 1952, Egypt witnessed a remarkable experience with rich political and democratic practices. Such an experience was marked by many challenges, such as the British occupation, foreign intervention in Egypt's affairs and the royal palace's interference in political life. However, in essence, The 1923 constitution could be called a golden age of Egyptian democratic development, with royal constitutional rule based on party pluralism and the principles closest to ones of a liberal democracy. In 1952, with the Free Officers' Revolution, the monarchy in Egypt was overthrown and a presidential republic was declared. Political parties were banned in the wake of the revolution. The revolution marked a clear shift from parliamentary to presidential powers. Subsequent presidents of the Egyptian Republic from Najib, Nasser, Sadat and Mubarak enjoyed overwhelming powers and exercised almost complete domination over the Egyptian public and political life. The president could even pass legislation by decree and repeal it at will. No post-revolutionary Egyptian president has permitted development of a viable opposition. The parliament's role was to select the presidential candidate who then ran unopposed in a confirmation referendum as only candidate. This has changed only in 2005, when for the first time there were more than one candidate. However, the institution of parliament was preserved and elections were held regularly throughout decades. In 1956, the new constitution was proclaimed stipulating for the formation of the National Assembly in July 1957, with a membership of 350 elected members. However, it was effective only for a couple of months, until 10th of February 1958, when the Egyptian-Syrian unification into United Arab Republic entered into force. The 1956 constitution was revoked. The provisional constitution of the United Arab Republic was enacted in March 1958, and a joint national assembly was established, with members being appointed, 400 from Egypt and 200 from Syria. The position of the parliament was not bright. It first met only after more than two years, in July 1960, and lasted for about a year until June 1961. The United Arab Republic was dissolved on the 28th of September 1961, 
with separation between Egypt and Syria, ending the union that lasted for only about three and a half years. In March 1964, a new temporary constitution was declared, which re-established an elected 350-member National Assembly. Under the influence of socialist ideas and in reaction to the passage of July 1961 laws, at least half of the members needed to represent workers and farmers, and ten members were appointed by the president. In 1971, a new constitution was enacted, updating the democratic representative system. The Egyptian parliament was again bicameral, made up of the People's Assembly of Egypt and the Shura Council. The People's Assembly was a lower house, made up of 454 deputies, 444 of whom were directly elected, while the remaining 10 were appointed by the president. The constitution reserved 50% of the assembly seats for workers and farmers one to be elected in each two seats constituency. The term of the assembly was five years, but it could be dissolved by the president. In 1977, amendments to the People's Assembly electoral law were introduced, with the aim of allowing wider popular representation. In the same year, the law was adopted to allow the formation of political parties for the first time since 1952. In 1979, the first multi-party legislative elections were held. The Shura Council was the upper house and was created in 1980 through a constitutional amendment. The council was composed of 264 members, of which 174 were directly elected, and the president appointed 88. The mandate of the members was six years, and the membership was rotating, with one half of the council renewed every three years. The Shura Council's legislative powers were limited. On most matters of legislation, the People's Assembly retained the last word in the event of a disagreement between the two houses. The upper chamber was abolished in 2013. Even though the powers of the Parliament have increased since 1980 amendments to the Constitution, the Parliament lacked the powers to effectively balance the powers of the President. Mubarak's personal rule continued almost unchallenged until the Arab Spring in 2011. We will now move a bit to the West, to Tunisia, when it comes to relationship between the legislative and executive power. A similar political dynamic existed as in Egypt, namely, for nearly the entire period between Tunisia's independence in 1956 and the Jasmine Revolution in 2011, a popular uprising that unseated President bin Ali. The Tunisian political system featured a powerful presidential regime, backed by a single political party. The 1959 constitution granted the president sweeping executive and legislative powers. The neo distour party, from 1988, the Democratic Constitutional Rally, known by its French acronym RCD, led by Tunisia's first president, Habib Bourguiba, remained the only legal political party until 1981. The predominance of the president in the political system was solidified in 1975, when the House of Representatives, a unicameral parliament, unanimously bestowed the presidency for life on the aging Habib Bourguiba. This was the end of the process of complete centralization of power under his progressive but increasingly personalized rule. Mohammed Mzali, who was appointed prime minister in 1980, made efforts to restore dissidents to the ruling party, and by 1981 had granted amnesty to many people who had been jailed for earlier disturbances. In addition, he persuaded Bourguiba to accept a multi-party system. The outcome of the elections in November 1981 was disappointing to those who sought political liberalization. The National Front, an alliance of the Destorian Socialist Party and the trade union movement, swept all 136 parliamentary seats, a result received with dismay by the opposition. Meanwhile, an Islamic opposition was developing around the Islamic tendency movement. National elections in 1986 were boycotted by the major opposition parties, and the National Front once again carried the vote. In November 1987, amid widespread unrest and growing Islamist support, Bourguiba was declared mentally unfit to rule and was removed from the office. He was succeeded by General Zain al-Abidin bin Ali. President bin Ali promised political liberalization and a transition to democracy. His early reforms attempted to restore a national consensus. One of these 
the National Pact signed in 1989, drew together the ruling party, the legal opposition, the Islamists, and all the national organizations. Many political parties were legalized, but the 1989 national elections still failed to introduce a multi-party competition. The president gained 99% of the vote, and RCD won all 141 seats in the legislature. Local elections in 1990, boycotted by the opposition parties, were also swept by the ruling party. Following the end of Persian Gulf War, the government began to crack down on Islamist political activity. Although the government initially eased press controls and released political prisoners, the opposition soon became disillusioned with the new regime. Reforms have failed to produce any genuine form of power, sharing or transfer of power away from the president or his party. Ben Ali won re-election in 1994, 1999, 2004 and 2009, each time by an overwhelming margin. The government, for its part, has claimed that democratization must be a gradual process that cannot be allowed to destabilize or inhibit the processes of economic liberalization and social consolidation. Similar as in the case of Mubarak, Ben Ali's rule continued without serious challenges until the Arab Spring in 2011. Going to Northwest Africa, to Morocco. We are adding monarchies in the equation of relations between the executive and legislative powers. The Sultan, and from 1957, the first king of Morocco, Muhammad V, established a constitutional monarchy in which he maintained a large amount of authority. Muhammad V made use of partisan rifts to assume the position of an arbiter above party divisions. He nevertheless continued preparations for the creation of a parliament until his unexpected death in 1961, when his son, Hassan II, succeeded him. King Hassan II began his reign by naming himself Prime Minister and appointing a new cabinet. He then drew up a new constitution which was adopted by a national referendum in 1962. This constitution made the king the central executive figure of the government. It also created a bicameral parliament and an independent judiciary. 1963 till 1965 was the period of the first legislature in Morocco, with the House of Representatives, consisting of 144 members, elected for a four-year term by direct universal suffrage, and the House of Councillors consisted of 120 members, elected by indirect universal suffrage, and the House of Councillors consisting of 120 members, elected by indirect universal suffrage, with no renewal of half of the members of the House every three years. The period of political reform, however, came to an end, when Hassan II was granted full executive and legislative powers under the state of emergency measures, declared due to political unrest over allegations of government corruption in June 1965. When the protests were quelled by the government, the king restored the parliament, but with more limited powers. A new constitution was drafted in 1970, eliminating one of the houses of the parliament and increasing the king's powers. The House of Representatives, now the only chamber, was elected for the second time and consisted of 240 members, 90 of whom were elected by direct universal suffrage, 90 were representatives of local communes and 60 were members of professional associations and chambers. The constitution was abolished after an attempted military coup in July 1971. The following year, King Hassan announced another constitution but its implementation was largely suspended following another attempted military coup in August. This document allowed the king to maintain his powers, but it more clearly defined the balance of power between the monarch, council of ministers and the parliament. Elections held in 1977, creating the third parliament term until 1983, while the fourth parliament term was formed from 1984 to 1992. The 1990s were marked by greater liberalization and a sense of personal freedom, although direct criticism of the political establishment was still prohibited. Amnesties for political prisoners signaled a new attention to human rights, while curbs on the power of the police and security forces suggested closer adherence to the rule of law. The constitutional amendments in 1992 and 1996 expanded the parliament's powers to include budgetary matters, approving bills, investigating ministers 
and establishing ad hoc commissions of inquiry to question the government's actions. The House of Representatives gained powers to dismiss the government through a vote of no confidence. Since the constitutional reform of 1996, the legislature again consisted of two chambers. The House of Representatives of Morocco had 325 members elected for a five-year term, 295 elected in multi-seat constituencies and 30 in national lists consisting only of women. The Assembly of Councillors has 270 members, elected for a nine-year term, elected by local councils, professional chambers and workers. The subsequent three legislatures, the 6th, the 7th and the 8th, were elected under the Constitution of 1996. King Hassan II died in 1999 and his son Mohammed VI took the throne, promising to end government corruption, releasing prisoners and address human rights violations. While the Arab Spring protests were not as violent and turbulent in Morocco, they did lead to the further adaptation of the political system marked in the 2011 Constitution. Moving to the Levant now, for many years after gaining independence in 1943, Lebanon maintained its parliamentary democracy. The main problem for Lebanon was how to implement the unwritten power-sharing National Pact of 1943 between Christians and Muslims. The 1943 National Pact established the political foundations of modern Lebanon, allocating political power on an essentially confessional system based on the 1932 census. Seats in Parliament were divided on a 6 to 5 ratio of Christians to Muslims. Positions in the government bureaucracy were allocated on a similar basis. The pact also by custom allocated public offices along religious lines, with the top three positions in the ruling Troika distributed as follows. The President, a Maronite Christian, the Speaker of the Parliament, a Shia Muslim, and the Prime Minister, a Sunni Muslim. In the early years of independence, before the calls for pan-Arab unity came from outside, the National Pact faced no serious obstacles. Throughout years, the Parliament in Lebanon managed to play an important role in securing the power-sharing between Christians and Muslims. However, by the end of 1960s, Muslims had become openly dissatisfied with the system. Aware of the higher birth rate among Muslims and higher emigration rate among Christians, Muslims at the time were already a majority, which was not reflected in parliamentary distribution faced with the opposition of the Christian politicians to abolish or alter the system. The country was slowly sliding to a civil war, which broke out in 1975 and lasted for 15 years until 1990. On October 22, 1989, the most members of the Lebanese parliament last elected in 1972 met in Taif, Saudi Arabia, and accepted a constitutional reform package that restored power sharing in Lebanon in a modified form. Efforts to alter or abolish the confessional system of allocating power have been at the center of Lebanese politics for decades. Nonetheless, many of the provisions of the 1943 National Pact were embedded in the 1989 Taif Accord, perpetuating sectarianism as a key element of Lebanese political life. The power of the traditionally Christian Maronite president was reduced in relation to those of the Muslim Sunni Prime Minister and the Muslim Shia Speaker of the National Assembly. The division of parliamentary seats, cabinet posts and senior administrative positions was adjusted to represent an equal ratio of Christian and Muslim officials. It reapportioned the parliament to provide for equal representation of Christians and Muslims, with each electing 64 of the 128 deputies, of which 43 are Catholics, 27 Sunni, 27 Shia, 20 Orthodox, 8 Druze, 2 Alawites, and one evangelical. Parliament subsequently convened on November 5, 1989 in Lebanon, where it ratified the Taif Accord. A commitment was made for the gradual elimination of confessionalism, and Lebanese independence was affirmed with a call for an end to foreign occupation in the South. Although distributed on religious bases, all members of the Parliament, regardless of their faith, are elected by universal suffrage forcing politicians to seek support from the outside of their own religious communities. The parliament is elected by universal suffrage, based on a system of majority or 
winner takes all for the various confessional groups. There has been a recent effort to switch to proportional representation, which would provide a more accurate assessment of the size of political groups and allow minorities to be heard. Most deputies do not represent political parties as they are known in Western-style democracies and rarely form groups in the parliament. Political blocs are based on confessional and local interests and personal family allegiance, rather than on political affinities. The parliament traditionally has played a significant role in financial affairs, since it has the responsibility for levying taxes and passing the budget. It also exercises political control over the cabinet through formal questioning of ministers on policy issues and by requesting a confidence debate. As a constitutional monarchy, Jordan has survived the tribulations of Middle Eastern politics. The Jordanian public has experienced developing democracy since gaining independence in 1946. However, the population has not suffered as others have, under personalized rule. After the establishment of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan and the proclamation of the 1952 constitution, the bicameral system was adopted for the parliament, which is called the National Assembly. It is composed of an elected House of Representatives as its lower chamber and a Senate appointed by the King as its upper chamber. The Senators are appointed by the King for four-year terms. Elections for the members of the House of Representatives, planned to be held every four years, have frequently been suspended from the 1950s until 2000. The National Assembly has a small but relevant minority representation through reserved seats for Christians and Circassians in the House of Representatives. Initially, the Constitution did not give the National Assembly the right to propose laws and restricted this right to the government only. Oversight was granted to the National Assembly by the Constitution through questions and discussions, while the issue of the right of casting a vote of confidence in the government was excluded. The first House of Representatives was elected on October 20, 1947. Over the next 20 years, until the occupation of the West Bank in 1967, Nine Houses of Representatives were elected. The Ninth Parliament, elected in 1965, was prorogued several times before being replaced in 1978 with the National Consultative Council. An appointed body with reduced power to debate government programs and activities. Three such councils were formed subsequently, the first in 1978 and the third and last were terminated in 1984. The term of each council was two years. The Tenth Parliament was reconvened in a special session called in January 1984. The issue of Palestine has heavily affected Jordanian politics since the establishment of Jordan until the present day. It was equally reflected in the composition of the House of Representatives. In the Jordanian Parliament, the West and East Banks initially received 30 seats each, having roughly equal populations. The last Jordanian elections in which West Bank residents would vote were those of April 1967, but their parliamentary representatives would continue in office until 1988. In July 1988, King Hussein dissolved Jordan's lower house of parliament and announced the severance of all legal and administrative ties with the West Bank, which included the removal of seats from the West Bank in the Jordanian House of Representatives. Effectively, the parliament was suspended for more than a year. In November 1989, Jordan held its first parliamentary elections in 22 years for the 11th House of Representatives. The King's action to reintroduce parliamentary elections was considered a significant move forward in enabling the Jordanian public to have greater freedoms and democracy. The Freedom House labelled this as the Arab world's most promising experiment in political liberalisation and reform. The 1952 constitution allowed for citizens of Jordan to form and join political parties. Such rights were suspended in 1967 when a state of emergency was declared with the martial law and suspension of parliament. This situation continued until it was repealed in 1989. The resumption of parliamentary elections was reinforced by new laws governing the media and publishing 
as well as fewer restrictions on freedom of expression. Following the legalization of political parties in 1992, 1993 saw the first multi-party elections held since 1956 for the 12th House of Representatives. The elections for the 13th House of Representatives were held regularly in 1997. In 1999, King Hussein died and the throne was passed on to his son, King Abdullah II. In his first years as king, the new monarch carved out a vigorous foreign policy. Strong political and economic bonds were formed with neighboring Arab states, especially Egypt and Syria. Government security services thwarted several violent attacks by Islamic militants, directed mostly at the security services themselves. In 2001, the king dissolved the House of Representatives to reformulate the electoral system. New MPs were elected only in 2003, when the elections for the 14th House of Representatives took place. The new parliament was made up mostly of independents. The Islamic Action Front polled highest among the organized parties. Domestically, Jordan's effort to reform its electoral process were hampered by the country's continuous identity politics. Primarily the tension between Jordanians of Palestinian origin, who to somewhat greater extent support opposition groups, and Jordanian descended from tribes, who tend to support the government. Elections held in 2010, boycotted by the IAF, yielded a strong majority for pro-government representatives, mostly with Bedouin and tribal affiliations. <music> Moving to the Gulf, to Kuwait's parliament, by far the most developed parliament among the countries in the Gulf. Established in 1963 as part of the country's first post-independence constitution, it is the oldest and most powerful institution of its kind in the Gulf Arab countries, all of which are ruled by hereditary monarchs. The parliament is now situated in an astonishing postmodern building, designed by Danish architect Jon Otson in 1972 and completed in 1982 under the direction of his son Jan. The Kuwait National Assembly building features off the form exposed white concrete as a surface colour and texture most prominently displayed in the building. The project won the competition because of the logic and clarity of its planning, its strong influence from traditional Islamic architecture and its adaptability to changes. In his book on Otson, Richard Weston considers that, despite the design and post-completion problems it has faced, the Kuwait National Assembly building remains one of the few architecturally compelling Achievements by a Western architect in the Middle East. It remains a striking achievement, inviting comparison with the similarly fraught adventures of Corbusier and Louis Khan in the Indian subcontinent. In the Gulf, Kuwait is the closest to having a constitutional monarchy. In her article, Kuwait's Parliament, an Experiment in Semi-Democracy, British political scientist Jane Kinnanmort explains that the constitution and the parliamentary powers impose some real constraints on the ruling emir, although most political power still lies with the ruler and his family. As a result, she argues that the experience of Kuwait's parliament, the perception of its achievements and failures, have a bearing on the ways in which the idea of having parliament and the notion of democracy itself are perceived in the other Gulf countries. Kuwait's parliament, the first to be introduced in the Gulf countries, remains the most powerful elected institution in the Gulf region. Kuwait had its first elected legislative council, the Majlis, in 1938 by a restricted electorate after a campaign by influential merchants. The modern-day parliament was introduced by the post-independence 1962 constitution, which was written by an elected assembly. Women only obtained the right to vote in 2005, more than doubling the electorate. It has been argued that establishing a national parliament elected by Kuwaitis helped to contain tendencies towards a pan-Arab nationalism in the 1960s. When post-colonial nation-state boundaries were being challenged and Egypt and Syria, and more briefly Iraq and Jordan, experimented with Arab unions. The rhetoric of Arab unity is particularly raising anxiety in Kuwait, given its long-standing border disputes with Iraq. <music> 
Kuwait's relatively powerful parliament is often seen as reflecting its specific traditions, while the al Sabah rulers were historically regarded as first among equals, rather being glorified as rulers or seen as holding religious legitimacy. Many authors describe the al Sabah's position in pre-old Kuwait as Sabah preeminence rather than hereditary monarchy, noting that the financial power of Kuwait's merchants allowed them to limit the power of the ruler. In his article, The Challenges Facing Kuwaiti Democracy, Ghanem al-Najjar has described the relationship between the merchants and the al Sabah family as joint governance, based on complete interdependence. Jane Kinnanmort further explains that the balance of power was altered with the coming of the oil age and the nationalization of the oil sector in 1975, which placed the country's key economic resource in the hands of the government instead of the merchants who had previously owned it. As in most other Gulf countries, the government now controls the bulk of country's economic resources, which provide the majority of government revenues. It no longer needs to levy taxes or rely on financial contributions from merchants. This means the relationship between parliament and government is somewhat different from the situation in countries where corporate and private taxation provides most of the government's revenue. Yet, Kuwait's MPs do seek to scrutinize public spending, raising questions about the government's budget and the state's sovereign wealth fund, while also spending much of their time trying to obtain a greater share of rentier state benefits for their constituents. The parliament comprises 50 MPs elected directly by voters in five constituencies, while the cabinet ministers, who are royally appointed, are also considered members of parliament by virtue of their office. There is no legal basis for establishing political parties as in all Gulf states, but there are de facto political blocs that perform some of the function of parties. It has sometimes been argued that Kuwait's parliament does not constitute a model for other Gulf states as each has its own unique history and traditions. Nonetheless, a highly successful parliament in Kuwait would be likely to inspire other Gulf nationals to call for the same rights at home, given Kuwait's importance as a rare example of relative democracy. It is hardly surprising that media outlets owned by governments and princes around the Gulf may be keen to emphasize the failings to the Kuwaiti parliament and downplay any advantages. Kuwait's MPs arguably bear an additional responsibility given their impact on the wider perception of democracy in the Gulf. You've listened to the third episode of the podcast Parliament Through Time, where we explored the beginning of the parliamentary development in the Middle East, North Africa and the Gulf. There was an uneven development of the institution of parliament across this part of the world, Parliaments were mostly dominated by the strong executive, presidents and monarchs, which in most cases even exercised legislative powers, while parliaments were reduced to the performance of the oversight function. It was only over time that parliaments had been slowly but surely gaining legislative powers. Another conclusion is that the parliamentary development in the countries of the Middle East and North Africa was not a straight line. Parliaments were often dissolved, prorogued, and for a significant amount of time even abolished and replaced by consultative assemblies or bodies of such nature. Yet, the dominant elites were always returning to re-establishment of parliaments, expanding their powers and the voters' base. In the next episode, we will be moving back to Europe and addressing the restoration of parliaments as central democratic political institutions in post-communist countries. Stay tuned and stay safe.